All right. Good morning. We are here with a very special guest, an old friend of Doug Casey, uh, the legendary Robert Proctor. Robert hasn't done a lot of interviews in recent years, but uh, if you've been around for a while, you know about him and his uh, use of the Elliott Wave, Elliott Wave principle for financial forecasting. Of course, he's written more than a dozen books also. Uh, in any case, uh, Robert, thank you for joining us today. What's your view of the, I, I have your most recent newsletter here. You talk about the bubble. You talk about the markets, and uh, even since the most recent issue, a lot's happened. So I'd love to hear your update. Well, what's happening and what can people do? You know, I thought the stock market was overvalued in 2000 and 2007, but what happened in 2021 was just, just staggering uh, how overvalued things got. Uh, the stock market was historically overvalued relative to earnings, relative to corporate sales, relative to GDP, and not by a small amount. Some of those multiples might have been around 2.0, averaging at the tops of 2000, 2007. And we got into 2021, and they were well over three times these various indexes. Um, but even those measures didn't con don't convey how extreme things got in 2021. I'll, I'll give you one example. I, I put out a, a newsletter titled A Stock Market Top for the Ages. This was December of 2021. So it's right sandwiched in between the tops in the broad market indexes in November and the blue chip indexes in January 2022. And I showed 25 indicators that we had shown during the year 2021, all of which were at ridiculous multiples of previous extremes. I'll just give you one example. You know, the Ridex funds keep a lot of data and it's very useful. And back in 20, uh, 2007, maybe in 2000, when their customers got really bullish, they would invest two to three times as much money in their bullish funds as they had in their bearish funds. And in 2021, that multiple didn't stop at two or three times. In terms of the investment money in the long, on the long side versus the short side, we had a multiple of 60. It was ridiculous. And then if you look at the leveraged funds in 2021, there was 80 times as much money in the leveraged long funds as the leveraged short funds. So when we talk about extremes, the, the old days were nothing compared to the insanity of 2021. And incredibly, we're still seeing some signs of that even today. One of the things you talked about in this most recent newsletter I thought was very interesting is you talked about, you know, the the bubble uh, market or the, sorry, the bull market in nothing. And you use, you describe these, you know, bull market, like the NFT bull market, for instance, it was in, in nothing. And then the most recent one was these uh, short dated options funds. Which is I hadn't I didn't I had heard about those, but I didn't really understand how how big they've gotten and how they are bull market and nothing essentially. Yeah, it's roulette, you know, spin the wheel. There are zero date uh, expiration options, so they expire the same day they go out, and people actually gamble on these. And, and so all the smart guys on Wall Street said, "Hey, let's make an ETF." You know, everybody buys ETFs. <laughs> Why do it buy an ETF, which is a derivative of one-day options, which are derivatives, is beyond me, but uh, I'm sure it's extremely popular. So, yeah, these indications of a continued mania are absolutely stunning. And I'll give you one example that's going to go into the October issue, which goes out tonight. Uh, my friend Peter Eliades has been watching a ratio of conservative uh, stocks versus speculative stocks. So. Uh, what we have, for example, would be a ratio of the NASDAQ 100, which is the most uh, speculative group, the high flyers among the tech stocks, divided by the price of the Dow Jones utility average, which is, you know, historically very conservative, you know, the regulated industries, um, they paid dividends. So way back when the NASDAQ 100 was created back in 1985, the ratio of the NASDAQ 100 to the utilities was 0.6. So the utilities are actually worth more. Well, in 2000, that ratio got all the way up to 18 times. 
Uh, and then, of course, the NASDAQ fell 83%. So fast forward to 2021, and we got up to 18.4 times. And that was, again, where I was saying these indicators are, are crazy. Well, here we are in October 2023, almost two years after the broad market topped out. And the NASDAQ 100 to Dow utility ratio is 18.9. So even though we're almost two years into a bear market, even though it's been very slow uh, going so far, investors are as crazed for the speculative vehicles as they were at top tick. So the psychology has yet to break. I think what it does, is going to be pretty dramatic. Oh, that makes all the sense in the world to me. I've got to ask you something, though, because... Uh, I, I don't watch the all the indicators that you do other than reading the newsletter, which uh, I will just comment to listeners now. This is one of the best newsletters out there, or frankly, that's ever been out there. So yeah, I suggest everybody listening uh, take advantage of it and uh, subscribe to the thing. But one thing, say we haven't talked personally for a long time, is when we talk about speculative stocks and goofy penny stocks and so forth, uh, in the past, these crazy little worthless mining stocks have often treated me very, very well because they're extraordinarily volatile. But uh, now, even though gold is 1900 to 2000 an ounce in that area, uh, the mining stocks haven't done anything. They're still flat on the bottom. So how do you correlate that? Or do you? Do you have an opinion on it? Well, I think if you're a speculator, is like you are, uh, that's probably a good vehicle. I remember buying some, you know, Western mining issues back in 70, was it 74 maybe and, and 79. Uh, the, the spreads were crazy. Um, it was a, a tough market to make money in. Um, I've always, for for most people, uh, I've always recommended you don't want gold futures and you don't want promises to pay, you know, what certificates. And I don't even want mining stocks. I think you want the hard metal. And you also want it stored somewhere where people can't get their hands on it. So one of the recommendations I've got in, the, in my book, Conquer the Crash, is how do I store my gold, silver, platinum, or whatever, uh, maybe some domestically, you know, just, just for emergencies, but I think this, the smart way to go is offshore. And one reason is, you probably know this, but I was a couple of years ago in California, I think it was Los Angeles, a private safety box company got raided uh, by the FBI. And instead of just taking the boxes of the people they thought were guilty of something, they seized them all. And so you want to make sure you're in a jurisdiction where that's highly unlikely to happen. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world. I mean, mining stocks are speculative vehicles, and that's the end of the story. They're burning matches. Commodities, yeah. also, commodities I think in general are reasonably cheap now, too. And I know you follow commodities as well. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, this, is, this may sound strange from, from someone who likes gold as well, but I think the U.S. dollar is, is in a, a bull phase right now. Um, it bottomed pretty much along with interest rates when they were negative here, even in the United States on T-bills back in 2020 and 2021. Uh, but also the dollar's been trading inversely to the stock market. So when the stock market went down, bottomed in October 2022, uh, the dollar got strong. And when the market recovered into approximately July 27, Aug 1 of this year, the dollar got weak. Well, the market's been slipping since then. And the dollar's gotten strong again. It was at 99 just a few, a few months ago, and now it's at 107. So I think even though we all have our skeptical views of the U.S. dollar, the world still sees it as one of the safest currencies. And I think it's going to continue to trade counter trend to the U.S. stock market, at least initially. So, um, you know, I've been recommending for maximum safety something that Kind of was way under the radar, although I've noticed they picked up recently something called floating rate notes. 
They're like treasury bills, but they're cooler because you get the contract for two full years and it adjusts every week to the T-bill rate, the 90-day T-bill rate. So you're getting the T-bill rate. So the whole time that rates have gone from zero to one to two to three to four to five and now five and a half percent, this FRN floating rate note has adjusted upward. So it's providing a really good income at currently virtually no risk in a rising currency unit. So I think this has been a great place to be. Someday we're going to have to get out of that when the U.S. gets in further trouble. But right now, to me, that's one of the top safety uh, avenues, along with metals and a few other things, too, that we can talk about. You know what, uh, Robert, you had in your newsletter, um, you know, you, you talk about kind of the chart, the, the pattern, essentially the, the cycles of, uh, of course, the prices of different things, the markets, but you also, it gets related to social factors too. You know, I mean, for instance, you charted the popularity of uh, Biden and showed its relationship with, the, with certain in indices. And I wonder... Maybe it would be worthwhile to explain to people who might not be familiar with kind of the, the, the under uh, overarching concept uh, to a lot of your forecasting. Sure. Yeah. My uh, theory is that there are such things as waves of social mood. They're internally regulated. They're not buffeted around by news. In fact, social mood is the sort of the driver of social actions which end up being reported as news. And that's why the stock market turns before the economy, for example, because it's mood uh, that is driving the stocks and it's doing it almost instantly. So when mood is peaking out, stocks are overpriced. And when social mood turns negative, stocks start to lose value. But it takes a while for the economy to catch up because even if people are making contemporaneous decisions, say, to cut back on business, it takes a while for that to happen. It may take 6, 12 months for them to affect all that. So that's why the economy lags the stock market. But it also shows up in all kinds of other ways. In fact, um, in tonight's monthly issue, I've got some pictures of uh, the latest fashions among women. And we've noted, of course, other people have noted for a long period of time as well, that women tend to dress in a friskier fashion when social mood is positive and stocks are high. Well, the latest thing is they, they were trying hot pants back again. They threw them out for the no pants look. So now when we're going around, at least on the runways and a few of the, uh, you know, models and, and actresses and things like that, uh, with basically wearing underwear. So if you want to see some pictures of that, be sure, be sure to tune in <laughs> for the latest issue. So that's just another indication that. Social mood is incredibly positive. People are still trying to buy the nifty seven, you know, tech stocks, and they're, and they're still dressing in a frisky manner. <clears throat> but there's some pretty cool hints of a change in the wind. And we have been in a bear market for two years, so we're, you know, past the top. Now, what happened after the top of 1966? A year after that, 1967, you had, uh, unrest in the Middle East. What happened after the January 73 top? Well, nine months later, in October 73, you had unrest in the Middle East. What happened after the first quarter 2000 when stocks topped out? Well, in September that year, you had unrest breakout in the Middle East. Here we've had a top in 2022, and a year later, we're seeing unrest in the Middle East. So that tends to be a tinderbox that flashes very soon after major tops, usually in six to 18 months. And it just happened again. I mean, right on schedule, we're watching this stuff, thing saying, I think our analysis is correct. The major top is behind us. You know, this was what we call a wave two high. You get wave one down, that bottomed in October last year. Then you get the first recovery, that's wave two. Well, wave three is the center. Mm -hmm. I think we're heading into that now, and that's going to be a very powerful downside move. So... I think our model is working pretty well to date. We'll see how the next few months go. How does it relate to oil, if it does, Bob? Well, I think um, commodities in general uh, are operating in their own uh, group psychology uh, based on uh, people bouncing off of each other and buying because others are buying. It's all hurting. And there's a chapter in a book 
that I wrote called The Socionomic Theory of Finance. There's a whole chapter on our history of, of predicting oil, and I think it's probably been our best market uh, ever since uh, we started. And you wouldn't think so, because most people would argue that oil goes up on supply and demand, and it makes perfect sense. But we've gone back and studied the different changes in supply and demand, and we can't link it up to the oil price, but it hooks up to the Elliott Wave model really well. So the big question, and I've been kind of coy on commodities for the last year or so, um, because I think there's still a massive risk of a deflationary episode where people are throwing stocks overboard, they're throwing bonds overboard, you know, Oh, this is another area we got to talk. Bonds have just had the worst two years uh, since the founding of the country, okay, in terms of total return. And yet they still haven't thrown the junk bonds overboard. I mean, we have not gotten, gotten to, the, to people really getting scared for fundamental reasons. We're not even there yet. So, so the worst couple of years in bond market history are a prelude. That's an amazing thing. Yeah, that relates a little bit to, you know, I, I've always followed the business cycle. You know, government pumps up money, it creates artificial prosperity, and new businesses blossom that shouldn't blossom, and it goes bust. And this is the business cycle, but <clears throat> I, I've been a bit confused by the um, lack of a predictive, predictive business cycle because They've created trillions of new currency units, which has thrown a spanner into just about everything. Yeah. I mean, where is this going to end? And it appears that modern monetary theory has uh, conquered Washington, and they actually believe they can print money in unlimited amounts to finance the things they want. So is this having an, an effect? Is this changing the the nature of uh, where the markets are going? Well, we, we usually ask the other question. What, what um, effect is social mood having on people like Fed governors? Uh, you might remember in 1929, 30, 31, during that period, first in the 20s, the Fed was very expansive. That's because social mood was racing toward the positive. And when it started going negative, they actually got more conservative. And what's happened since 2021? You've watched the Fed get more conservative. They've uh, followed market rates upward, which they do all the time, but they've actually even uh, brought in some of that money supply. Not a lot, but some. So I think we're seeing a mindset change even among uh, people on the Fed board. Another interesting thing about it, people say, well, it's a direct cause. You know, more inflation produces higher prices for things. Well, back in 2011, 2012, when gold first, you know, got up toward two thousand um, dollars, Bernanke was in in office, and and he was saying, "We're going to start buying forty billion dollars of of the government bonds a month." And then a month later, he said, "Now we're going to start buying forty billion dollars worth of mortgages every month for the foresee unforeseeable future. We're not going to tell you when we're going to stop." And a lot of gold bugs said, oh, my gosh, this is the ticket to paradise. And, I, and we wrote up and said our headline was last chance to sell gold. And sure enough, it went down and down and down throughout the entire initial QE program and then even beyond. So it's, it's the waves that are in charge of prices. And the Fed can do almost anything, but I don't think it has much um, power when it comes to anything near term. Now, long term, when they debase the currency, all prices follow, ultimately follow. However, it's not just currency that they create. As you know, they've created $9 trillion worth of fake money. But there must be a quadrillion dollars worth of IOUs out there that are piled onto that base money. And that's where the risk is, because if creditors um, become unable to pay these debts that everybody who thinks they've got a million dollars because they have an IOU from somebody are going to wake up one day and realize they don't. And, and that's money or what people think is money, just IOUs start to disappear. That's when you can get a deflationary episode. If we get a really bad one, we got a little hint of that in 2008, remember? 
not only did stocks go down about 55%, but commodities collapsed, <clears throat> went down big time. I think we face that kind of risk here. So I wouldn't have all my money in commodities either. I am for basically total safety in every way I can think of it right now. What does that mean? I mean, okay. It's it's, like, it means FRNs we already talked about. I, I think, you know, I, I like five and a half percent of free money on what currently is one of the safer places to invest if you can invest in debt. Uh, metals, I think you need to have gold and you need to have it stored offshore. I think if you're a domestic U.S. person, you definitely should have some bags of junk silver coins. I mean, I've had those for decades. And who knows, if things get really nasty, you might have to go out and buy some things with with uh, coins that people recognize and are recognized, you know, 1964 and, and earlier when they had real silver in them. Um, I think you shouldn't have all your banking in the United States. Uh, I've had it identified a bank I really like offshore. It's got a very high liquidity ratio. They're the very safety bind. Um, so I recommend that in Conquer the Crash as well. But, you know, you have to do your homework. It's going to take you a few weeks to get an account there because they do their due diligence and everything else. And if you don't, you know, do it while you have the chance and you start getting into a panic mindset, you're not going to be able to act. Um, another thing that I think people should strongly consider is a second passport. Again, not that we know what's going to happen, but if something happens that you feel is really locally a danger, um, you know, what if the wrong people were to take over and say, you know, we've decided it would be a bad thing for U.S. citizens to travel outside our borders right now, so we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, honor your passports. It's good to have options. So I've spent a lot of time, you know, thinking what are those options. You know, a lot of people are depending on Social Security. I don't think that's going to last. A lot of people are depending on their pensions. But do you know that it was pension funds and insurance companies that bought up almost all of that issuance of 100-year Austrian government bonds that were yielding, I don't know, a half a percent? I right. mean, you know, was... why? And so now they're down, those bonds are down 60% in value, and they're being held by people that are supposed to look after your retirement. You know, this is not going to work. So I'm looking at it. Practical solutions that anyone can do uh, that rely on you, not somebody else, um, and trying to cover all the bases of what might happen. When you when you look at this, you said wave three. What's the what's the timetable on that? I mean, and how, oh, you, how what do we look for first? If yeah, I, I wish I could tell you the timetable. I've been wrong on that for years because the market's been so over about the price for so long. And I've said, oh, man, they can't go any higher. And it, it just blew me away when we saw those readings in 2021. But strictly from structure, uh, the wave model is not about time, particularly. It's about uh, form. And these waves can take different lengths and different retracement percentages and so forth. But if wave two is over, which I believe it is as of the summer of this year, and we're heading into wave three, wave three is going to be a lot bigger than wave one, which, you know, took us down anywhere between 10 and 20 percent, depending on the index. So wave three should take the market down a lot more than that. I, I guess I'm not going to start giving out percentages because uh, people will question my sanity if I do. But just just suffice it to say that the risk in stocks today has never been higher. So mm -hmm. stay out of the way at minimum. Just don't don't have your money. That's some people say, oh, yeah, that's OK. You know, I'm averaging down. Well, I don't recommend that. Perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps that it makes sense to buy some long-term puts on certain stocks just as a hedge. For instance, I bought a bunch of puts on Moderna, which is partially for the reasons that you indicate, and partially because I think the company is going to be sued to kingdom come because of its involvement in the vaccines. So I'm playing it both ways, and I have, oh, God, 15 months to run on them. So that's the type of thing that you wouldn't be totally uncomfortable with, I, I presume. Oh, no. In fact, the, the thing is, Doug, you and I have met people, you know, for 50 years, 40 years on the circuit. 
And most people uh, can't handle financial risk and pressure very well. Um, and, you know, suppose I'd said, you know, buy some long-term puts in 2021, even though that was the top year, you haven't made much money because the market's only off a little bit. And as you know, there's a lot of time premium in those things. Uh, but yeah, I think puts, uh, short futures, all those things are fine for people who can handle the risk. Uh, I think, in fact, there's potential for some of the greatest downside profits ever. But I don't make those recommendations in my letter because I don't want it on on me if if those leveraged bets don't work. Yeah, I completely agree. But you said something right before we started recording I thought was very interesting, and that is, you know, we see what feels like to me, like a prelude to World War III. I mean, with what's happening first in Ukraine and then so easily could expand from there. And you said something about how, so I, I see that, I think just thinking that's a, that's a, that could relate, that could happen in tandem with a market crash. Um, you said that often is not the case, that they're not necessarily connected. Yeah, we've, we did uh, some studies of when wars break out. To, uh, you can go all the way back to, uh, let's say, uh, the Revolutionary War. English stock prices peaked in 1720, and they bottomed in 1784. It was near the end of that period when they finally had to go to war with their own colonies. Um, 1929 was a major top. The stock market crashed in 1932, but there was no war then. So it was in the second decline, which went from 1939 to 1942, when World War II broke out and it was, was at its worst. So it's the second phase. Under the Elliott Wave model, we call it wave C. So you have A down, that's the financial crash. You have B, partial recovery. And then C is when everybody gets angry. Um, I think we're going to have the same type of thing uh, happen here. So the first decline is going to be the financial debacle. Then we'll have a recovery and people will be kind of edgy, but they'll feel things are better. When we get the next big decline a few decades from now, that's when we're at risk for World War III. But I think we're, we're going to be afraid of World War III during this decline. That, that's for sure. But I don't think it's going to break out until the second big drop. Mm. Well, you're looking actually <clears throat> quite a bit further in the future uh, based on that past, let's say, 2030, which is uh, what the Schwabenklaus tells us is the year of the Great Reset. Yeah, I don't know about uh, that. Um, you know, I don't know when this wave A is going to bottom. Uh, but what what's kind of interesting, if you look at the decline from, say, uh, 1835 to 1842, it took seven years. That was, and then we had a steeper decline in 1929-32. That didn't take seven years. That took less than three years. You go back to 1720 in the South Sea bubble. The crash after that was over in two years. So it's almost the, the, the bigger the degree of the top and the more overvalued things are, sometimes the faster the decline occurs. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. So I've been ready for the kind of crash that just, you know, sears the hair off your head because it's just so dramatic and there's nothing people can do and it happens so fast that nobody can react. The administration doesn't react. The Fed doesn't react. They don't know what to do. At the same time, there are, have been plenty of bear markets that start a little sl slower. They take their time, and they have many uh, drops on the way down. If you study 1930 to 32 and spread it out on a weekly basis, you can see how many times the market sharply dropped and then spent two months trying to go up, sharply dropped, trying to go up. Spent more time going up than down, and at the end of it, they were down 89%. So bear markets can take different shapes. I don't want to try to anticipate that off the bat, but the crash of risk here especially this time of year, heading into now, now into December, is outsized. So yeah. wouldn't an, an additional... I think, it's those, I think it's a good time to own those puts. You're probably yeah. doing the right. Wouldn't, wouldn't an additional risk be the fact that the world is, I think, quite over-financialized today? Uh, I mean, it's not just a coterie of people on Wall Street, but... Everything's financialized with so many instruments and so many people involved in the markets and so forth, much more than it's a society-wide thing, even more than it was when Shushan boys 
or supposedly buying stocks. And like, that's just my anecdotal feeling, but I, I, I can't give you evidence. You probably have the evidence if you think that's you're, true. You're a hundred percent right. In 1929, they estimated that at the absolute peak, a maximum of 10% of the public was interested in stocks. And, and now everybody's in stuff, you know, even if it's indirectly through their corporate pension fund or, or whatever. Uh, and we, we've been called, uh, Pete Kendall, who works with me, uh, is one of the editors of the LA Wave Financial Forecast, which goes out monthly as well. We overlap, kind of leapfrog one after the other during the month. And his term that he coined back in 1999, I think it was, was the equity culture. You know, you'd see, you'd see it referred to even in, in comics, in the newspaper and stuff. It's everywhere. And I think before the bear market is over, people aren't going to want to hear anything about it anymore. I don't want to hear about, you know, even after 29, people were keeping their money in mattresses for decades after that. And this is, this is, what we have now dwarfs 1929 in terms of overvaluation and the breadth of it, as you're pointing out, everybody's involved. Every country on earth is involved. Every government, every central bank. The central banks and the governments have been not only fostering money printing, but they've been, they've been trying to encourage people to go into debt. Uh, you, can, you can deduct mortgages from your income tax. What does that mean? It means all your neighbors are helping you know, pay your mortgage. Other, other taxpayers who don't have a mortgage are helping pay for it. You've got Fannie Mae, you've got Freddie Mac, you've got uh, the federal home loan banks, uh, you've got the student loan program, trying to everything they can think of to force people into more and more debt. This morning, there was an article in the paper that said uh, the percentage that the average family is spending on their mortgage right now has just gone up to 27.2 percent of their annual budget. More than a quarter of all the money they earn is going to the banks to pay off the mortgage. So, you know, bankers have everybody's money uh, and and uh, that is good for them temporarily, but in the long run, it's going to ruin them as well. They're going to come down with the whole pile. Well, when this comes unglued, uh, people are going to be unhappy and they could get very angry and blame people. For instance, I... I've been notoriously gloomy for many years, seeing the overall descent of society and the collapse of the ideals that have made America, America. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't say these things anymore, because when things get bad, they might blame people that predicted it for having caused it. Like Roosevelt said, all we have to fear is fear itself, and you don't want these these mongers of gloom and doom making things worse and so forth, uh, especially with the, the racial situation, which has bubbled to the top for some reason, and sexual perversions, which are everywhere and so forth. It, it can get kind of scary in society, don't you think? Um, I'm, I'm going to give you my take, and I, I think you'll find that it's good news for people who think like we do. Back in the 20s, the kings of the, the people who were all over the newspapers were business people. They were the owners of General Motors and the owners of RCA and, and you know, they had their three-piece suits and their gold watch chains and the top hats. And they were, they were the people who were in the news because as Coolidge said, the business of America is business. So when the crash happened, who got the blame? The visible people. They were the, the capitalists, you know, the guys with the big companies. And they said, well, they're, they're corrupt. They're terrible. And, you know, who was it? The Match King jumped out of a window. And, and they were the ones who got the brunt. So then what do we get? We got a socialist uh, president. And we haven't turned back from socialism since. So we've got more and more of that. Everything is run by the central government or, or local politicians. Well, now who are the visible people? It's the political people. It's the, it's the president. It's the vice president. It's the Congress people and so forth. And I think because they're so visible and they continue to claim that they're the ones who made life so great and uh, they're the ones who should get the credit for how well people are doing, they're going to get the blame now. 
in October before the last election uh, of 2020, I said, vote for the person you like the least. Because if the market's topping out, as we think it is, they're going to be suffering in the polls tremendously. And whatever party wins could actually end up breaking apart, as the parties did back in the 1840s. So uh, I think we're on schedule for that. You know, the, if you track Biden's popularity, I think it peaked the day he walked into office. It's been going, it went down with the stock market right into late 2022. It recovered somewhat into earlier uh, spring this year. Uh, but it's been tracking not the Dow and not the NASDAQ. It's been tracking the Russell 2000, which has been weak. And his popularity is falling right along with the Russell 2000. I think he's going to break all records uh, or low popularity uh, that we have, uh, which I think goes back to Truman um, before this thing is over. If he even made it to the end of his term, I don't know. But um, it's, it's, it's bad news for the people, for the incumbents. Well, it seems to me that for the first time ever that I can think of or remember, I wonder if we're actually going to have an election in 2024 for a number of reasons. Things could get wild and woolly. Maybe some war will really heat up and get big. Uh, but uh, I, I think the party was in, the Democratic Party was in a position to do something like that. Um, a year ago, because they had both houses of Congress, they had the presidency. They just missed, because of a fluke when Donald Trump got elected, they just missed taking over the Supreme Court uh, with left judges. And had, if, had that gone in their direction, had they been able to, you know, fill the court, um, they'd have, you know, every branch of government and all the agencies as well under their control, and it would have been possible. I think it's becoming less likely for a couple reasons. Number one is the opposing party at least has one house in Congress. The Supreme Court is is leaning more conservative than uh, than left, um, and the popularity of the current pop party is slipping. So those three things I think are severely hampering the ability to say, "Hey, for the good of the people, we're not going to have an election." So I think we will have an election in 2024. I could be wrong, but that's why you need that second passport. <laughs> no, no argument here. How do you handicap it? Do you have a feeling? Or who's uh, the what? The election? Oh, I think if, if the incumbent were, we, I, my colleagues and I did a study. It was, it was an academic study. It was published, I think, in 08. Uh, and we went back 200 years and studied all the times that incumbents ran for re-election. And what the stock market had done the previous three years uh, had something like a 95 percent uh, probability of, of predicting whether they would win or lose. So with the stock market lower, and I think going to be much lower by the time the next election comes around, if Joe Biden were to run, I think he would lose in a landslide. But I think the chances of, of the incumbent running are very low. And whether uh, our studies show that people don't usually blame the party if they put a hold different person up rather than the incumbent, um, then our prediction is, is no longer, we, we can't predict based on the stock market. Um, but I still think that there's a, a party connected to him and to Congress that will probably suffer in the next election. So I think the pendulum is going to swing hard in the other direction. But only if the stock market goes down, which I think it will. But if it doesn't, I, I can't stick with that. But another factor to consider, perhaps, is that um, the world revolves around the government now much more than it ever has in the past. And um, if things get bad, perhaps some bright young man will come up and say, give me a lot more power and I can kiss things and make it better. People are used to the government kissing things and making it better. So perhaps somebody like Gavin Newsom will be the uh, Democratic candidate. And uh, what's going to happen to Trump? And are these people in the United States going to get really angry at each other? If uh, I mean, the red people will be quite angry if they go out and vote and Trump doesn't win. And how does Bobby Kennedy fit into it? Have you thought about that or not? I don't know. 
I don't know if you have or not. Yeah, I I, I don't get in the weeds of politics too much, but we um, did a study on third party candidates. They tend to appear in bear market periods when social mood is turning uh, negative and people are sick and tired of the people in power and they're, they're looking around for others. Um, they tend to come during uh, recessions and depressions or shortly after them. Uh, the 30s, of course, had the Socialist Party. They had Ross Perot after the 1990 uh, recession. He, he did pretty well. And so now we're, you know, almost two years after the major top and you've got another third party candidate. So that's the kind of thing we can do pretty well is is use waves of social mood to predict that kind of thing. But whether they're going to win, you know, that's a whole other subject. And we're too far away to try to predict that for me anyway. I mean, as a third party candidate ever won? Uh, I'm not to my knowledge, but, my but they do, but they do, um, skew elections. They do. Hmm. I think that's how so, we got uh, folks. Um, exactly. Right. We're like, uh, yeah, Ross yeah. Perot split the vote. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. So what's the, what's the biggest concern you have today is you obviously that, the that we could be close to that, the bottom dropping out of the market, but is there something is there some other, maybe even not necessarily academic fear that you have um, that that just as your mood, you know, because this because your your the attention you pay to the social mood is is uh, it's a new way of thinking about things for me at least. So I'm just are the things that you're looking for to know that you should be worried or is uh, what? actually selfishly speaking, the thing that worries me most is that I'll be wrong. <laughs> I hate wrong. <laughs> I need to be wrong, and every time I am, it's no fun. Uh, but let's go back to the, the, where you were coming from, which is your social question. Uh, personally, I think the biggest um, problem that the country faces is that um, the left has taken over the educational establishment from kindergarten on up. And so it could well be that, you know, 15 to 20 years from now, if those people don't change their philosophies, they'll be running everything. And uh, it'll it'll be too late. You know, we'll be like Venezuela. We'll vote in uh, collectivist solutions to everything. Um, and then maybe that is part and parcel of why we're going to go through a 100-year bear market. You know, people think that's crazy as well, but I don't think so because of the overvaluation and also because of the precedent. Uh, from 1720 to 1784 was 64 years of bear market in England. Uh, I think we're facing something like that. I mean, the the recent overvaluation and from 2021 is our version of the South Sea bubble. It's just bigger. So I think we're going to go to a period where, you know, investments are are be, become more of a niche again, where the money men care, but the average person doesn't. That's years down the road. We have to get past the uh, the crisis first. Oh, I can see that because talking about bigger things in the world, one of the biggest, it seems to me, is mass migration from third world countries to the U.S. and, for that matter, uh, to Europe. Uh, there's nothing that's going to stop uh, not just millions, but tens of millions of people from from the South and overwhelming Europe. Uh, so the last thing on people's mind, as you said, might be the stock market at some point for that reason. Yeah, I mean, radical Islam is on the rise. Um, I think the key word is radical. There are always people of every religion who are moderate and they get along with their neighbors just fine. But then there are people who think if I just kill enough people, even if I die, I'm, you know, I'm going to be in paradise in the afterlife. And so that's a huge risk. And when you get into a negative mood period, these kinds of actions definitely come out. And we're seeing the beginning of that, you know, last Saturday uh, in the Middle East. So uh, that way of thinking has spread throughout Europe, especially in Germany, France, and England. So I think some of those countries are at risk of losing centuries of their own identity. Uh, so we'll have to see. I mean, will the people that moved in absorb the local identity or will they, you know, force a new one onto the locals? So, yeah, there are certain places 
Doug, you you mentioned earlier that you know there were you know, you got to look around for for a safe place. I don't think many European countries that we're used to uh, visiting are going to be the safest places in the future. I don't think I'd choose one of those. There are a couple of countries, Poland and Hungary, for example, that have pretty much kept their borders um, solid, where they let people enter legally and so forth, but not cross in droves. So they've managed to keep whatever identities they've had. I know people who live there, you know, they're all in favor of them. But of course, there, there are people on both sides of that question as well. I think it's kind of interesting. A lot of people are upset about uh, uh, Latinos coming into the United States. <clears throat> From my experience, our, our, the place we, I live now, and I've lived here for 40 years, um, has gone from 0% to 50% Latino in the past 20 years. And so far, it's been a terrific experience. They start businesses. Uh, they're very successful. They send money home. Their kids are going to school. They're doing well. Uh, everybody's getting along fine. You know, people are speaking English and Spanish all over the place, but everybody's getting along very, very well. A lot of hardworking people have come in. Um, and so they bring Catholicism with them rather than Islam. It's, there's a difference. So you have to decide, you know, which, which, who's got the better deal there? Interesting. You know, I think uh, your comparison to uh, 2021 as our South Sea bubble is like the major takeaway for me. I haven't had it. I haven't heard anyone heard anyone willing to make that connection. That's a, that's a big connection and pretty frightening when you think about it. Yeah. So it's yeah. I think the world is gonna it's gonna be like a light switch. It's gonna be very different it just within a year or two at the most. Uh oh. So I want to encourage everybody to. Definitely go subscribe to the Elliott Wave uh, Theorist. I'll have a link in the description to the video below. So please go check it out. Um, there's a, an offer there where you can get uh, 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 a book for free as well. It's uh, what's the name of the book again? It's uh, Conquer. Funny you should ask. There we go. And you, in Conquer that book, you have the name of the bank that you researched, the, inter the, foreign, the International Bank. Is that right? I, do is I, lead, I lead people to a landing page where we give all the information because and people like that don't want to be, don't want their name oh, wow. thrown around. So, you know, people, if you're interested, yes, we have a landing page. You go learn about it. You send them an email and, and introduce yourself, and then you, you take it from there. All right. That, that's uh, reason enough for me to sign up. Yeah. For oh, anybody perfect. who's just listening and, and doesn't have a, any, any words below uh, the video, it's elliotwave.com, two L's and two T's at Elliot, wave like on the ocean, dot com slash Doug. And just because the great Doug Casey is who he is, uh, we're, we're giving people a discount on that. So, And so, hey, Doug, I want to say a personal note as well. Um, we go back a long way and it, it's always... One of my favorite times in New Orleans is when we just get together for coffee because oh, it's great. really hard to find people in the world who have what I would consider extremely radical yet 100% correct ideas, and you fall in that category. So uh, you've got a following for a good reason. Well, and I'll echo that. When it comes to yourself, and I'm really one of the major reasons that I'm unhappy that. I'm not coming to New Orleans this year because we're not going to get to hang out for a day and uh, and catch up. But uh, I, I want to sincerely emphasize to the people that are listening to this that uh, you want to take Bob's letter because it's interesting in addition to highly educational. And I've got it also very well written. So all right, we have kind of a mutual admiration society. I guess that's okay. We've known each other about 45 years. <laughs> yeah, it's about 79 at least. Yeah, right. About. I think 79, Maybe. if I remember. Yeah, Maybe. so and don't forget, if they go on your page and then they do subscribe, they're going to get a brand new issue tonight. And it's going to talk about some of these things we've been talking about. So the timing was good. I was really happy when you called and said, you know, today you had a slot open. So thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for doing it. I'm going to get this video uh, downloaded, edited, and published so that people can take advantage of it today. So thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure.
Yep. It's great. Take care, guys.